Hello and welcome to the next Hermetic Principle of the Kibalion, the Law of Vibration. This is perhaps one of my favorites because it's easy to illustrate, it's fascinating to talk about and we've heard it so much that is, it just makes sense to click it into anything, any sort of model that we talk about. Now, uh, again, my frame of reference is always the law of one for uh, anything metaphysical that explains reality. And it's not to say that I'm always rigid about the law of one, but I'm mentioning it because you know that Ra mentions vibration almost as much as they say uh, distortion. So vibration is everything. You know, even when they say names, they call people people's name uh, vibratory sound complex or they're always using vibration, you know, here and there. Uh, vibration is, is, a, is everything. So that's why is, uh, it's third in the Hermetic Principles, I believe, because it does make sense. We've so far covered the law of mentalism, which just means that everything is mind. It's easy to understand now that we went through it. And also, if you can grasp the idea that anything that we can perceive in the world is perceived through the mind, not from anything else. I mean, the ultimate uh, realization is that consciousness is actually what's creating the mind. But so far as the manifestation of anything is mind. So mind is what manifests things. Then we get, went into correspondence. The law of correspondence just states that every single principle applies to all of the different planes, which are infinite, but we like to talk about them in terms of body, mind, and spirit. And now we're talking about vibration. So this is a little bit more, uh, or should I say less abstract. Um, it's, it's a lot easier to, to put into context. So that's why I'm usually excited to talk about vibration in the way that it, you know, in the Kibalion, they do a pretty good job. Uh, it's, it's not ex as extensive as I would like, but they do cover things that I'm going to cover here that I, are important. And I'm going to add something else at the end, which is really what's the practical stuff, the mind. So to begin, um, the Kabbalion says, and we, you know, we shouldn't be surprised of this, that nothing rests, everything moves, everything vibrates. Uh, just for completion, I'm going to mention that when they say everything is the manifestation of the universe. Um, to me, there is consciousness, which is undefinable. That is my word for talking about God, source, infinity, um, anything that cannot be described, which is ultimately the reality that we are. And you are that, thou are that. So. Yeah, if you don't get that idea, just realize that you are conscious. That's it. It's that simple. It's not, it's not complicated. You need metaphys metaphysics. You don't need anything. That's why Buddhism is not concerned with metaphysics. So just realize that the ultimate reality is consciousness and you are conscious. That means you are consciousness. So, um, you know, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. But that's, that's just, you know, the background of everything. However, uh, in the Kabbalion, they talk about the manifestation or the manifested universe. The closest they get to talking about consciousness, and they do get, you know, they express it pretty good in, uh, I believe is the, the all in all. There is, a, there is a chapter where they say the all in all. That's where they kind of emphasize the idea that, you know, there is something beyond explanation that they call the all in caps, all in caps. I love how they use all in caps, you know, sometimes to uh, emphasize a point. It just feels like they're, uh, they were uh, ahead of their time <laughs> in terms of the internet. When people just want to emphasize something, they put it all in caps. So in any case, so this is true. You know, nothing rests. The only thing that rests in itself is consciousness. But again, you know, we're not talking about that nothing rests in terms of the manifestation. Everything is vibrating, everything moves. So that is true. Now, I'm gonna talk about the quantum vibration because uh, we don't even have to go to quantum vibration yet. We know that everything is energy and we'll start our journey in vibration by realizing that 
temperature, what we feel is vibration. It really is just energy and its movement. So what we perceive as cold is a certain degree of uh, movement. When we feel hot, then is a higher degree of movement or vibration. Okay, so that's just energy, simple as that. Light is vibration, is simple vibration of energy that we perceive through the eyes and that's why we have colors, that's why we have x-rays, we have radar, we have radio waves, we have uh, gamma rays. All of that is what we uh, know as the spectrum of light, okay? But that's vibration too, it's energy vibrating. Um, uh, our sensations, our vibrations of our uh, nerve terminals, the, what we feel is just a vibration. It's almost like if you touch something and you just kind of like waves, like if you touch water and create those waves, that's exactly what's happening with your skin. You're, you feel uh, vibration through, uh, through the senses. Um, audio is definitely an easy one to know that it's a vibration. We know it's just waves of, of sound, what we call sound. So that is vibration as well. Uh, and lastly, you know, to finish off with the senses, you know, taste is also a sort of vibration depending on how it's, it's associated with, with feeling, you know, with, uh, with sensing. So it's, it's the same thing, but it's just a different route to the brain. So in any case, we are, if you think about it, we are a decoding machine, which is the brain for vibrations. And the mind makes up what vibration is. And that, so everything that we perceive is vibration, right? So that's, you know, well and good for the macro, I guess our macro perspective of vibration in general. But let's go to quantum vibration. Quantum vibration just knows that everything simply is vibrating even at the lowest levels, like the protons are not still. When we go down to the atom, it's not still, the proton is not still, the electron is not even a particle. We know that we keep going and looking and looking in, in, in the mi micro, microscopic level and we see that there is no end to the vibration. There are just patterns of vibration of the one single energy that we know. So in uh, quantum physics, we know that everything simply moves. Nothing is at rest. So we're validating this the same um, understanding of the universe. It's just a multiplicity of vibration. And um, no matter how we see it, it's always going to be that um, that uh, pulsating that pattern that is being generated and that's how we see it uh, so far we used to think that there were and this is the reductionist science that or the reductionist view of science that you know they wanted to find the the fundamental particle and they keep um, they keep looking and keep finding something different so that that's only uh, bringing us to the understanding of the hermetic principles, which in history, you can see how much the hermetic principles have influenced even science back in the, in the enlightenment days, in the 16th century, 17th century, because it just made sense as opposed to the religious dogma that knew that everything, you know, everything was made by God and you, know, you should be, um, well, you know the whole story of religion. So, you know, there's, Science is pretty much close to this rather than, you know, uh, mechanical science. Like that's something that has been helpful for us in, um, in technology and developing um, solutions for the world, but it doesn't apply to describing the universe as an organism, as a living being. So vibration stays there, you know, it's, um, we're closely finding more and more through reduction in science because there's nothing else to find, but you know, the fundamental nature of the universe, which is uh, everything is connected. So now I do want to talk about something that I find fascinating because we can say then, you know, um, well, most of the stuff that we see is only a, a small portion of what really exists. Well, there's two things. One is that uh, without knowing much about science, we can say that Everything is space, you know, science even tells us, easy science tells us that our matter, the energy that we are, it's only a fragment, it's a very small portion of who we are. 
And if we can compress the whole human body into a, um, into a, a space that contains all the energy, it would be, I think it's the tip of the needle. Like it's something so small. The whole earth or the sun, I forgot, you know, it's just like the size of a pea. So we are space, but what is space? Is space empty? We're gonna get to that. That's the first thing that we can see that, okay, everything is space, but what is space? Now, in our uh, development of science, we realized that there was a big bang. There was an explosion uh, 13.7 billion years ago, and that this continued to expand and expand. And we said, well, gravity is going to eventually halt it, or it's going to uh, do a big crunch and um, it's not going to continue forever. Gravity needs to account for this, you know. And though we, we thought that was reasonable, we realized when we looked further that the universe wasn't slowing down and it was actually just expanding faster. So it was accelerating the expansion. So for that, we said, well, you know, if we take everything in consideration, then to fill the gaps of our equations, we're gonna create dark matter or dark energy. Actually, they created both, dark matter and energy, uh, which is fine. You know, it's only energy that we have, but they like to call it matter. That's fine. You know, there's just dark something out there. And we realized that that gap was about 97, 96% of the whole universe. So it's not space, it's not matter, it's something that we don't know what it is. Okay, now we can go speculating a lot, especially with the law of one. There is so much we can talk about the nature of the universe in terms of dark matter and energy and how there is spiritual mass and what's attracted, spiritual gravity and so on, but I don't wanna go there. The point is that we know, as science understands it, that we are living in a material universe or in a physical universe that is made up of 96% something that we don't understand. Now, space in general is not empty. Space is energy. As Nikolai Tesla found out, and he wasn't the first one, of course, he was just a Western scientist who brought it to us. And this is what we call zero point energy because space is filled with energy. So how come can it be filled with energy yet there is nothing that we can that we can measure. Our measurements or our tools for measurements do not account for this. Well, the tools that we use now, <laughs> not the ones patented that are hidden somewhere uh, by big corporations. So uh, what we find is that space actually has, and uh, there's a scientist now that I would highly recommend if you're interested in this stuff, who's called Nas, uh, Na, Nassim Haramein. And he, uh, he has this uh, Resonance Science uh, website. I, if, I, if I forget, leave me a comment. I'll try to remember and put it in the, in the comment section so you can check it out. So that's unified science based on everything that we know. And it's really, really up to date without all the issues that we have of pretending that we need to validate a model that helped us a long time ago. So now this is, these guys are like the Galileo of the time, you know, the um, Kepler and so on, those who went against the, the system of, of belief. But anyhow, when we talk about space, we're talking about a, uh, a pattern of vibration that is so perfectly geometrical that offers no resistance. That is, it's actually interesting, and I'll just mention this, that there is uh, the, the structure of space is actually uh, what they call cube octahedrons, which are tetrahedrons. Uh, tetrahedron, you know, is a, a pyramidal shape that is, uh, my drawings are terrible, but you can get the idea of a tetrahedron there. It has four faces and that um, that's a structure. It's one of the, the platonic solids, which are perfect. The, the only geometry, geometrical solids that we have are that are perfect are the platonic solids. So this is the most basic ones because you cannot have a three-dimensional shape, any three-dimensional shapes that is simpler than this. You have to have three faces. And so this one is the first perfect one that exists in 3D. 
Now, when we get 64 of this, we're going to have a cube octahedron, and that is the shape. If you put them all together, you're gonna get a structure, which uh, you can see here in the picture. It's, um, it's a really nice arrangement and perfect arrangement of, of energy movement. Um, there is a lot of science behind that that I don't even know, but it offers no resistance. It has perfect vertices and so on that uh, cancels out the, uh, the movement of, uh, I forgot what it is, but it's just, it's just fascinating when you go read it. So when you get all this, it, I think the number is also uh, interesting because we have 64, that's the first cube octahedron. Then the next one, it's 128. Then I believe it goes up to 256. And if you realize we're talking about the binary system that we use in computers, which is um, powers of two. And it's the same reason why we have electronics. You know, it's the easiest way to communicate or uh, transfer energy through these patterns. So it's the same pattern. It's not something that we make made out. This is actual uh, science and electronics validated or the other way around, whichever way you want to see it. So what am I getting at? Why this is all important? Because all the energy in the universe is actually what we call dark energy or matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so um, this is how you get zero point energy too. If you were to move these cube octahedrons, um, if you were create, which exists of course, but again, the patent is hidden somewhere because we can use that uh, for several reasons. We, we don't wanna go into, <laughs> into the dark side of our society, but this, this is what was hidden from us. Um, that if we basically, you know, and this is just a, my very amateur explanation of how, what's going on with uh, zero point energy. That's why it's called zero point energy because there is no resistance in space. However, you can make um, a sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, it's not a breach, but it's a, it's a gap or um, an opening in between these, these spaces. And when you try to open space, basically, if you try to open the geometry in space, uh, a rift, that's the word I was looking for, um, you will find that the whole space is trying to collapse in itself. It's trying to bring back uh, balance and geometry. That pressure in space, which exists in, in the whole universe, in any part of the universe, because it's space, it'll create pressure and that pressure can be harnessed for energy. That's why it's called zero point energy. Richard Feynman, one of my favorite physicists in the 20th century said that there is enough energy in one, and I think he exaggerated with the size, in one cubic meter, so that's a, a meter uh, cubic, imagine a cube that is a meter or a yard in, uh, for those who use inches, inches is a little bit more than a yard, but there's enough energy in a cube, um, cubic meter to boil the, all the oceans in planet Earth. So he knew as well, he knew that this, that space had energy. So the reason why I'm saying all this stuff, again, is because, and I'll get to that, there is a practical, I'm not giving you a science class for no reason, um, uh, but the point is that, and I'm gonna bring it to Nada Brahma, is that we have to realize that space, that we all are, matter is just a manifestation of a very tiny portion, matter, what we call matter and light, it's a very small manifestation of the whole universe. The rest lies in potential. So, what am I bringing this to? Nada Brahma is, it means in Sanskrit, um, Nada means uh, uh, vibration, movement. Brahma is God. So it's like, uh, everything is vibration. Same thing, everything is vibration, everything vibrates. That's the same conclusion that the Hindus realize. This is, in Buddhism, what we call the vacuum, the void, I didn't write it here, but, um, not a Brahma, it's not something like they, in cosmological um, or cosmological terms, Hinduism term, it's not just that. There is potential for the mind, and when I get to that. So, Akasha is the other word that we use for it because, and, and this is Sanskrit as well, um, Akasha is that field, is the field of, uh, of nothingness, of what we call the void. 
that's the, what, what I'm going to get at in the next point. So we know that this has potential for us in our mind and that that is what we find in meditation. This is what we find also when we disconnect from reality, when we disconnect our minds from the known world, from the known uh, matter and energy and thoughts and perceptions and everything else, we go inside and that inside really is, like I said, the whole universe, which is all energy and potential. We are creating as time goes on, if you will, um, the universe. We are creating more and more because the mind is the one that creates. So when we return to source, when everybody says, I'm going to source, I return to source, I commune with God, God can only be uh, looked inside, is because we're looking at the primordial vibration, which is the potential that we have for creating. It's coming from there. So Nada Brahma just reminds us of, of what we're now learning in uh, conventional science. We knew this a long time ago because it's easier to study the self than to study the universe. It just takes longer to study the universe. It takes us, it took us what, already 400 years or so of modern science to realize this. I mean, this probably took just a couple of decades uh, of work, and probably not even that, you know, just inside work. So, void, sunyata, ether, quantum foam, source field, those are the different words that we have for space, potential space of energy. And um, I like the, uh, these last two as quantum foam and source field because it's explaining in scientific terms that we have access to this uh, for practical purposes. But we also have sunyata or the void, which is the inner uh, expression of this for meditation and what we would consider the, the use of this energy for our own uh, realization of what we are. And so going back now from all the um, science jargon and now getting into the abstract of the inner self, we get into the most important part of this video, which is the mind. The mind is, like I said, and um, at this point we know already, by mentalism, the mind is everything. The mind is what connects us from Maya or to Maya and also the source field, the ether, sunyata, the void, just these two are one and the same. The mind is the connection to that. If you see everything else here as abstract and here as real, because the mind is simply thoughts, emotions, perceptions, feelings, sensations, and so on. It's just what we perceive. We can only perceive that through the senses and the senses work with the manifested energy that is this uh, creation. So when we realize that the mind is the portal in which we connect to the void and to the illusion of creation, Maya, then we know that we can go to the source. We go to the source to realize more who we are in this manifest itself. That is the key to everything. And we know that vibration helps in this. And this is the practical um, uh, solution that I'm going to give you here. Because once you realize, because you're going to tell me, Gabe, what are you talking about? This doesn't make sense to me. How am I going to apply this aside from meditating, going back to, you know, source and whatnot? Well, simple. As we know that temperature is vibration, light is vibration, uh, our feelings or sensations are vibrations, everything else, we know that our thoughts and our emotions are vibration too. That doesn't escape. Remember, correspondence. As above, so below. So as within, so without. And in our mind, it's working the same way. We have different patterns of vibration. This has also, also been, uh, I love to, to uh, quote science because science is what it's supposed to do. It's throwing empirical uh, evidence for us to see what's happening. And this is the, the bridge um, that is, cymatics show this. In cymatics, they show how uh, in a plate, they move sand through vibration or sound and it creates patterns. Now, that 
or I already talk about, you know, that, that's, that's already uh, explained. However, there is studies that when you freeze water that has a word, just a written word, or even the emotion that was sent to the water as hate or love, you create different patterns because those are vibrations that are coming out from us. Why is this important? Because when water is vibrated by our emotions, it shows, it's like an imprint. It's, uh, it's our digital uh, print of what we are. And we can see, we can map out the emotions and what they are. When we look at the patterns that are created by love, it's always a, again, the mind recognizes as beautiful is it's, um, it's geometrical in shape. And it's just, you don't have to be a scientist to realize or an artist to know beauty. And you can see the beauty there. However, when you see hate, fear, and um, any negative emotions or low vibrational emotions, then we see that there is a distorted uh, pattern of vibration that is there. This is important because that's what's guiding our sensations and feelings of the world, how we perceive the world if we're always in low vibration uh, emotions. And if we are in higher vibration, then we are a lot more whole. So that is a huge practical point in terms of how vibration is important for the whole universe and our all being, because we're looking for um, connection. And that's what patterns are. Patterns are beautiful connections, you know, depending on how we create them. So the key point to take here is uh, the mind. Your mind is the one that is accessing the quantum foam, the ether, whatever you want to call it, dark energy to manifest it here. Your emotions, your mind is almost like through emotions, it's telling you how you're creating your universe. And we all want to create obviously a coherent, um, very um, uh, companionship, uh, cooperative universe. That's what we're trying to create. That is the, the ultimate goal. It's unity. So through thoughts, emotions, and perception, and feelings, which is just what we are, uh, we can find that. And we can change that. That's the thing. We're not slaves to a universe. We are the universe creating this, and we naturally are inclined to improve or increase our vibrations in each and one of them. So that is... Um, the connection that I wanted to make, again, from the Kibalion, which says that everything vibrates. And in the Kibalion, the book, they do go into some of the science that was known back in the 20th century or at the end of the 19th century. Remember, this book was written uh, in about 1900, I think it was, 1890 something. So I wanted to talk about science as we know it, science as we don't know it, the metaphysical science or even just the mind science and then the practical sense of vibration in terms of who we are. So we're going back to, as we said, by the way, this is Julie always making nice um, images or illustration for us. And we're gonna go back. As you see, she made some waves. I said I was gonna talk about waves the whole in the whole Kibalion because I want you just, and this is the easiest one, I want you to relate the Kibalion to this one simple illustration of waves. This one is easy. Vibration is just waves. So <laughs> I don't have to explain much here, but to know that the whole universe is this. I said I was going to explain to you, you know, we got here mentalism, correspondence, and now we're talking about vibration. This is vibration. Nothing escapes this. Everything is made out of this. There is just vibration because that is the manifested universe. Now, just remember, Akasha, the source field, and everything else is this. That's why we can measure it. We have no point of reference. It's just there. That is the whole universe. And we are making this because we are the manifest itself. We are a complex system of vibrations that is making the universe. In fact, it would be more accurate to say that we are the product of an evolution of different systems, complex systems of vibrations, which we can call fractals. I wanted to talk about fractals here and um, 
I think I'm just going to throw in the fact that fractals are the nature of the evolution of the universe. If you're not fascinated with fractals, you're missing out because you can see how complexity arises from what they call um, self-replicated systems or um, I think it's self, uh, I forgot the term, but it's just, it simply has the same pattern over and over again and just keeps adding more stuff but in every part you can find the whole picture of the fractal. So that's why we also call it this a fractalized universe and you can see that in vibration because that's just the nature of it and we are that, we are that manifested part, this wavy part, we are all waves and that's it. All right, that's all I got for this hermetic principle which is the law of vibration. Hope that made sense, leave me a comment if you wanna add something else or questions or doubts or uh, whatever else and we'll wrap it up until the next which I think is the law of polarity and you can see how it starts getting easier and easier as we understand these concepts and apply it to our perception of reality. All right, I'll see you in that video.